I'm Charlotte McLeod with InvestingNews.com, and here today with me is Byron King of Paradigm Press, which was formerly Agora Financial. Byron is a geologist and a longtime newsletter writer who's worked with Jim Rickards. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great to have you here. Well, thank you, Charlotte. It's nice to see you, and greetings to everybody out there who's watching. Really nice to be catching up with you, and I'm going to mention that it's a bit of a, a long story to how we got here today. We were hoping to catch up at the Royal Symposium back at the end of July, but we didn't find that our schedules were matching up. So finally, we're here together. And I want to go back to that event with you and ask you what your takeaways were, because there is a lot going on during those three or four days. Oh, the yeah, the Rick Rule uh, Investment Conference, it, it was in Boca Raton, Florida, a nice, you know, 95 degrees, 98 percent humidity. Uh, but it was a great conference, fabulous conference, very well attended. You were there, obviously. Uh, sorry we didn't connect. We just There was just too much going on in terms of commitments and such. Very well attended, a very enthusiastic crowd. It really reflects how the, the, the resource investing crowd is, is small. I mean, we are, we are small but mighty. Uh, because it was enthusiastic, a highly enthusiastic crowd. You know, when you look at the standard and poor's, whatever, I mean, mineral investing is like one half of one percent or something of the S and P five hundred. It's ridiculously low, horribly underinvested at this point. Which means that if you're out there and you know uh, this is this is the time to get in. You know, when buy low, sell high. When you get to that high point, you want to have bought low, and now is now is low. You know, uh, so it, an enthusiastic crowd. What was a couple of interesting takeaways? One was how many of the exhibitors were coin dealers. Uh, a lot of, and they were doing a just a land office business. A lot of, they they had s numerous exhibitors, five or six, maybe seven, uh, coin, um, you know, precious metal dealers who you know came there with samples of their wares, obviously, and uh, they were selling silver coins and gold coins and you know bars and bullions and all these little, uh, you know, be because the people were. In fact, there was another conference. You remember this? There was another conference next to us. It was like. I don't know, the Southeastern Law Schools Association or something like that. They were walking over, the lawyers and the law school administrators were walking over to our exhibitors and buying coins. And they, and they were, hey, what are, they, oh, what are these coins? And so the lawyers, they didn't want to go to their conference. They wanted to come to our conference. That's how, that's sort of how attractive it is. I thought that was, that was, that was funny. That was amazing. Uh, other things, uh, some terrific, terrific uh, ideas were there. I'm, Robert Friedland of Ivanhoe and Ivanhoe Electric, uh, Ivanhoe Metals, Ivanhoe Electric. Wow, did he he blew the roof off the off the conference with that talk he gave? Uh, you know, with just what's going on with copper, what's going on with the electric metals, what's going on with you know modern, truly modern exploration techniques. Um, some you know, I mean, that was just one out of many uh, you know great talks of, but but hot, very very memorable. Uh, some great companies were exhibiting. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, in, there, people are very sanguine. Yeah, they're very nervous about the future. I mean, where is this world going? I mean, you know, you know, war in Europe, and tensions in Asia, and you know, all this macro inflation, and the Federal Reserve, you know, rising interest rates. And, and as, as we speak right now, I mean, the Federal Reserve just met today and said, hey, guys, you know, we're, 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 still, we're still on this interest rate, you know, uh, kick here. And uh, inflation's still out there. So, you know, when, when they raise inflation rates, that does tend to, uh, you know, put a lid on you know just precious metal prices, just because. Well, how do you compete with you know five percent you know bonds when you know you can just buy a bond and sit there and make your five percent? You know, it does put a lid on 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 the gold and the silver. But the thing is that they're anticipating more inflation. So if there's going to be more inflation, you know, the medium and long term is. That hard assets, meaning you know, real life gold and silver, the stuff that's already been mined, and you can buy the coins, and uh, companies with you know pounds in the ground, you know, with the gold, the silver, you know, copper, everything else, they are they're they're, they're out there, and they're as I said, they are so underbought, underinvested. So those are some of the takeaways that you know I came out with, and as I look back now, a few weeks later, um, it was a great conference, and uh, Rick Roll does a terrific job. His team was just fabulous. So you know, great. You know, kudos to kudos to everybody who was part of it and who put it on, and ev and everybody who was there. Um, so, 
Yeah, it was a really great event. And I like hearing your takeaways. Very funny anecdote about the lawyers coming over to buy coins. I did notice that conference going on next to us throughout the week. So very interesting. I want to bring up one of my takeaways from that event as well, which was there's a lot of talk about the upcoming, well, it was upcoming at that time, but the BRICS meeting. And we mentioned that you work with Jim Rickards and he did a, a great speech there talking about that new possible currency connections to gold. And we're actually talking at a great time right now because the meeting is just wrapped up. And so I wanted to touch with you on that at least briefly and get your takeaways from that meeting because I think people are looking at it and saying, okay, well, we didn't really hear about this currency. We didn't really hear about gold. So what does this actually mean? Oh, thank you for bringing that up for sure. Yeah, we, we happened to be speaking literally just a day after the, you know, the 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 BRICS, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, you know, it, it's that geopolitical alignment group. It started like 20 years ago as a marketing thing from Goldman Sachs. They were talking about BRIC without the S, without the South Africa, you know, uh, and and it was they, they were using that as as a Goldman Sachs marketing hook about oh these are the growth stories of the future, you know. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, China grew and you know Russia kind of did its economy and you know. Lots, lots of things going on in the Russian economy. You know, uh, India has their economy has grown. You know, uh, uh, you know Brazil. Brazil or, what can you say the country of the future? It has been for a long time. You know, uh, but but they're a big country and they're important. But BRICS now with South Africa, they have a geopolitical alignment. It is basically the, I guess we could call it the non-Western world. They talk about the global South, although you know Russia's kind of north and China's not exactly south. You know, but but it's the global South, the rest of the world that has just been dominated by the U.S., European, Jap Japan, you know, that kind of that Western hegemony for decades now. You know, that you know, when we say jump, you say how high, you know, we'll wave our dollars, we'll wave our euros at you and you guys will, you'll fight over, you know, who's going to, who's going to, who's going to, you know, take our money and everything. And you'll send us your stuff and we'll send you your money. You'll send us tankers full of oil. And we'll send you dollars, and then with those dollars, you'll buy our bonds. You know, well, the rest of the world is kind of caught on to. The, Wait a minute, this is kind of a con, isn't it? We send you valuable things like tankers full of oil, and you send us these dollars, and then we're supposed to buy your bonds to fund your deficit spending. They don't like that anymore. They don't think they're getting the good end of the deal here. So they're coming together, you know, the BRICS to say, you know, we don't like this. We're going to change it. Okay, so they had just had a big meeting in South Africa. And uh, one of the big takeaways was that they're going to add, uh, you know, six new players to the BRICS. It's going to be BRICS plus, you know, six. BRICS plus six. Hey, that rhymes. Uh, now, who are these players? Well, how about it? Interestingly, Iran, Saudi, UAE, United Arab Emirates. You know, so they're encircling the Persian Gulf. What does that tell you? Three of the key players within OPEC. You know Saudi, Iran, you know UAE. Um, so so BRICS has now become BRICS slash OPEC, you might say. You know, and uh, Russia is one of the three largest oil producers in the world. Saudi is one of the three largest oil producers in the world. The third of those is, would be the United States. So you know we're not we're not in that club, but you know, but but two out of three, that's a lot of oil every day. That's a whole lot of oil. That's you know that's twenty something million barrels every day. Um, and then, and Brazil, for example, is not shabby at all. Brazil is already there, bricks, you know. But uh, Brazil is a big oil producer, and they have massive, massive resources in that offshore area of Brazil. So, so right away, bricks is now an oil play. And then, who else are they going to add? They're going to add Egypt. You say, well, why Egypt? Hmm. Well, you know, try the Suez Canal. Try you know the big long coastline on the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. I mean, they are they are a key choke point for world global commerce, energy commerce, and everything else. Who else are they going to add? Well, they're going to add Ethiopia. And you say, Ethiopia, why Ethiopia? Look at them on a map. You know, they're down there at the bottom of the Red Sea, you know, kind of controlling that old Bab al Madeb, uh, you know, uh, area that, that straights into the Red Sea. And then Ethiopia is a kickoff point into the whole rest of Africa. So, okay, so they're, so strategically, geostrategically, we got we got the Persian Gulf with all the oil. We got Egypt with the Suez. We got Ethiopia with the bottom of the Red Sea and, and a kickoff into Africa. And who's number six? 
Argentina. You say, Argentina? Oh, man, that country is is crazy. They're, they're a wreck, aren't they? Well, yeah, they are in so many ways, you know, uh, you know, economically and what have you, but they are very wealthy in terms of their food production, their ag, and they are extremely well endowed with the mineral endowment, you know, in, in terms of, say, copper and lithium and silver and gold and many other things, you know, that the world seems to like. So, uh, and there's a highly strategic position as well in the, you know, kind of the southern part of South America there, you know, with the Old uh, Drake Passage and the straits around uh, uh, the straight around uh, the sail sailing routes around the southern part of, of South America. So when you look at a map, BRICS slash OPEC is now a an energy play as well. It's an energy powerhouse with a lot of whole strategic real estate that controls sea lines of communication. So that is what's going on now. Now I'll just I know we, we need to ask you need to ask me questions. And I need to give answers, but but I'll just say one more thing. You know, a lot of people out there were saying, well, isn't there going to be this BRICS currency out there? Aren't they going to come up with this BRIC unit of currency? Yeah, they were talking about that for months. I mean, they if you just, if you read what they wrote and you listened to what they said and you, you know, you watch what they did, they were working on a BRIC currency unit. Apparently, they could not kind of come together a meeting of the minds, you know, you know, you had, the, you, had, you had the Indians, for example, saying, well, we kind of like, you know, being able to buy oil with our rupees. And, you know, the Russians are like, we have warehouses full of rupees. But, you know, I mean, we don't we don't want to we don't want to get into this fight with you just now. You know, it's, and, you know, it, and then you get the Saudis saying, well, you know, I mean, we, we're selling our oil to China and you want. Eh, we've been doing this petrodollar thing for 50 years. And, you know, we, we still have to sort of straddle the U.S. and Europe and, and what we're doing here. But but the transitions happen. I mean, it, there is no question. But that you know that 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 the pendulum is moving in a very noticeable way you know, away from that kind of Western hegemony, the Western domination of the economics of the of the world trade of the how do you pay for world trade? Of, you know, uh, controlling sea lines of communication. The world is shifting away towards something else. And what that's going to be? Well, you know, we we can we can only speculate from here. But that's where that's where we're at. Okay, I thank you for going through that because I think, yeah, looking back at the BRICS meeting, people were thinking, okay, well, we didn't hear anything about that currency, so this didn't really mean anything. But as you've laid out, there are a lot of implications that go beyond that, and we'll start to see how that plays out. I want to talk a little bit more about oil because we're seeing, you know, what's going on with the BRICS, all of these oil-rich nations kind of concentrating over there. And I think the thing with oil is, you know, we want to believe, or or some people, some governments want to believe that we're getting away from that. We are transitioning toward cleaner sources of energy. But the reality, I think, is that oil and gas are going to be with us for quite some time. So I want to ask your thoughts on that and, and what else you can tell us about what's going on in, in the world of oil and gas right now. Oh, uh, well, there's plenty going on. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, you know, Russia and Saudi are, are the two, two of the three top oil producers, the third being the United States. Now, here in the United States, now, Russia has no, they, they love drilling oil wells. Saudi, they love drilling oil wells. Here in the United States, at the political levels, we don't like drilling oil wells. I mean, the, you know, the Biden administration is anti-oil, anti-fossil fuel in so many ways. You know, there is still leasing going on. You know, they lease the, they lease the oil leases, but then in come the regulators and say, well, you can't build a road and you can't build a power line and you, you can't build a pipeline and all these sort of things. So, so, so it's a very, very uh, bipolar, uh, uh, you know, cognitive dissonant uh, issue. You know, uh, the con- you know, say what you will about solar and wind, all these nice things. The country and the world, you know, I'm in the U.S., you're in Canada. Our countries and the world, it runs on petroleum, okay? And for everything that people say, for all the bad-mouthing that people say about oil, gas, and, you know, diesel and gasoline and jet fuel and kerosene and everything, you know, yeah, they still get on those airplanes every day and fly across the world. And they still, you know, they still go to the store and buy things that were delivered by diesel powered trucks. And the trains, you know, the trains run down the tracks with their diesel powered locomotives. This is a world that runs on oil. It is now and it will. And when people say, we're not going to be running on oil by the world in the year 2050, I say, oh, yes, we are. And to the extent that we are not, there's these other people called the rest of the world, the global south, that for every barrel, 
that we don't use in the United States or Canada, for every one of those barrels we don't use, somebody else will. They'll put it in their car, they'll put it in their tractor, they will yeah, they will do whatever they and then people say, Oh, you know, oil transportation. We do a lot more with oil than just, you know, drive cars, you know. I mean, oil is feedstock for plastics and what have you. I mean, that um you, you, we, we could not have an agriculture system without oil and natural gas. You know, uh, you know, tra- whether it's tractor fuel or fertilizer or herbicide, pesticide, drying agents, all the transportation that goes into it, all the food processing that goes into it. You know, without oil, we starve. Um you know, we could go down the list. I mean, it, I, I've sat on airplanes next to people and I say, oh, what are you doing? Geologists. And, oh, yeah. Well, I, I don't like the oil industry. I don't, what are you doing on this airplane? You know, what do you think makes this airplane fly? You know, I mean, there's not a solar powered airplane. Okay. You, you know, uh, people just, they just don't get it. So anyhow, uh, just last week, I was at a private event, I'll just say, in California. Uh, can't get more greenish than California with its energy policies and everything else. And uh, I was with a whole bunch of people, well, not a whole, but a small bunch of people, let's say, who really know their stuff. One of whom was the former Secretary of Energy of the United States, Rick Perry, uh, under Trump, his former governor of Texas, former Secretary of Energy. We had a long talk about everything, strategic petroleum reserve, about, uh, you know, you, you know, U.S. trajectories in terms of drilling, uh, I was with other people in that crowd who were extremely knowledgeable, absolute scholars of the Gulf of Mexico, of the central mid-continent, of fracking and what have you. And the U.S. is, like I said, we're, the, we're, the, we're in that top three oil producer routine, but without a lot of capital investment and without a lot of, you know, wise regulation and, um, you know, sort of wise hands-off regulation, we're, we're not going to be in that, you know, top three in in those numbers for too 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 much longer there's a lot more drilling that has to happen a lot of capex i mean we're talking hundreds of billions with a b of dollars need to go into the oil patch the oil and gas patch literally to keep the pipelines you know uh, loaded to keep the natural gas flowing to keep the you know natural gas means electric power it means you know chemicals and chemistries industry uh there's so much going on so people who say oh no 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 we, we need to de-invest in hydrocarbons. No, that's not going to happen. Think what you want about climate change. I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about climate change one way or the other. You know, you know it, it, I'm not going to do that. I'm just saying that where we are and where we want to go, you can't get there from here. Uh, and there, you know, we must continue to use oil unless you want to see an absolute economic sociological catastrophe um, not, uh, come out of it. Uh, we could talk. just in terms, you know, people, you know, we are the investing news network. Well, what's what's really strong in the hydrocarbon sector right now? The money makers are the refiners. You know, people like Valero, uh, Marathon Petroleum, uh, Sinclair uh, Oil and Gas. You know, uh, uh, they are minting money uh, at you know between at, in the refining and uh, you know terminaling and and, uh, and you know the, and selling it to the truck drivers and the car drivers of the world. What do they do with that cash? Well. It's hard to, you can't build a new refinery, you know, it's really hard to even upgrade an old refinery. Uh, so what do you do with your cash if you're a refiner? You buy back shares, you pay out, div- you raise your dividends. So, so um, you know, three three names that, you know, Valero, Marathon, and uh, Sinclair are, uh, are you know, I mean, we, we've recommended them a couple months ago. We're up 45% in, I think, like three months in those guys. Uh, but, you know, something to think about, something to chew on there. Yeah, that's really interesting because as as we were talking about how we really need all these different types of energy for the future, I was going to ask you, you know, can you then as an investor play the energy trend across the spectrum kind of in whatever way you want, but that gives people kind of a, a direction to go in if they want to, I think. Oh, sure. I mean, I mean, everything from big oils, big integrated oils, you know, the Exxons and the Chevrons of the world, you know, they, they're doing very well. And Exxon and Chevron, uh, their dividend to them is sacrosanct. They will sell their kidneys before they cut the dividend. So if you're if you're looking for a yield, or if you're just looking for basic strong dividend from now until you know until the until we have to play nearer my God to thee and the ship goes down, um, you know those are the guys that are they're they're, they're going to write you that check every you know three months or something. Um, you know I I mentioned the refiners. Uh, there are many other smaller plays. 
uh, there is a bit of a revival going on in the in the shale patch. In, you know, I say the shale, the tight oil patch, the fracking patch. I know fracking is well, it's a bad word. You shouldn't do that. But no, I mean, it, it, I mean, we're on about the fifth generation of fracking now. Uh, you know, when we think, oh, fracking. If you if you learned about fracking back in two thousand three or four or five, that was maybe like first generation. If you thought about fracking in two thousand twelve or thirteen or something. That was maybe the second or third generation. We're at the fifth generation of fracking uh, in terms of technology uh, and in terms of how much water, what kind of chemicals, in terms of the, the uh, efficiency of recovery. Uh, it's a, it's, there, there are some astonishing uh, ways of doing it. When people say, oh, fracking is too expensive. You don't make any money. Actually, that was true a few years ago. Now you can, uh, depending where you are, of course. Uh, now, the, the irony of it, the sad part of it is, that in you know there's only there are so many oil fields in the world and you know places that you can go fracking and things like that. A lot of the really good stuff was drilled up with first and second generation technology, and they left a lot behind. Now though, you can go into those like you know tier B or tier C level assets using the good the new technology, and you can actually you know make more money off of those than they were making way back when uh, in terms of the efficiency of production. Uh, and you can go back into some of the original really good zones, um, and you can refract them and make money there. So there's, there's. I'll be writing about this war in our in the Jim Rickards and newsletter, uh, Strategic Intelligence Paradigm Press, Paradigm Press, Strategic Intelligence. You'll find us. Um, I'll be writing about this more in the weeks and months to come because I, I was, uh, I had a fascinating meeting in the, with the California people about what's going on out there. I mean, we're talking true scholars of this. People have been, you know, absolute career, uh, you know, people in the oil industry who know their stuff. I, I mean, I, I had dinner for three hours one night. We didn't have dinner. We just talked for three hours uh, with, a, with a guy who in the last, I don't know, 10 years, he's drilled a thousand wells. You know, I mean, if you drill a thousand wells, a thousand oil wells, you're going to learn a few things. So, so this guy, you know, these people know what they're doing. So they know what they're talking about. So it, it's out there. The investment uh, uh, prospects are out there. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's really helpful. And we can leave a link. If you want to send me the link, I'll put it in the video description so people can find your writing later. We'll do that then. And so speaking of what you've been doing this summer, your travels, I know that you've also been doing some site visits, I believe around Canada, maybe elsewhere as well. I wondered if you could share highlights from those visits, just any, any things that you've learned. Oh my goodness! I, I yes, thank you for asking that too. Uh, I have I spent about a week, a little over a week, up in the Yukon, the storied Yukon with Robert Service. You know, a bunch of the boys were whooping it up in the Malamute Saloon. And I, I what a what a great place! What great people in the Yukon! Uh, so many great ideas, beautiful geology, wonderful jurisdiction to to work in, a terrific government uh, situation. Excellent First Nation relationships that pretty much squared away all of the you know the native First Nation uh, land claims and such. You go in there, you can work with people, you get things done. Um, you know, it's got uh, it's got got power systems, got a road system, you got your airports, everything else. Um, and so I was, I was I was up there, and then just a little over a week ago, I was uh, up in Northwest British Columbia in the storied Golden Triangle. You know, kind of at that, kind of about that same at, uh, latitude as Ketchikan, Alaska. Like you get on the peninsula there, you get on Panhandle of Alaska. Ketchikan's kind of the bottom there. You just go straight east, and you're in that sort of um, uh, Stewart, Alaska kind of area. Lots of great stuff there. Oh my goodness! Uh, again, the geology, the people, the geologists. Um, they've been they've been working up there for 120 years. You know. Um, Actually, this is the 125th anniversary. 2023 is the 125th anniversary of the Klondike Gold Rush. So, what happened then? Well, you know, people came up from Seattle and Vancouver and all over the world, really, and they would land in um, Skagway, Alaska, I guess, and they would, you know, walk across, walk across the mountain, across the snow, and everything else to, to, to you know, shake their pans in the in the streams of the of the Klondike. I mean, at the original people who were up there. They used to talk about ounces per pan of gold, you know, uh, uh, ounces per pan. Of, of the, of the, of the, wow, you know, I mean, anymore, it's much different. Now, that was just, you know, panning the stream beds. 
They were prospecting, you know, and in 125 years, every place up there, somebody has walked over it. You know, somebody has prospected it with their eyeball, walking around with a hammer, walking around with a steel rod, you know, kind of poking around through the soil. What do we got here? You know, picking things up, you know, somebody's prospect, but it has never been properly explored, certainly with not modern techniques. So you've got satellite data, you got airborne data, you got geophysics, you got this, you have incredible geochemistry that's going on out there. Uh, you've got beautiful, beautiful, you know, uh, drilling techniques that can locate, you know, just uh, just really, my goodness, in terms of the, the efficiency of recovery. The co so there's a lot of very efficient exploration going on up there. A lot, lots of companies, lots of names. Um, and, uh, and, and, and when it hits, it hits really big. I mean, you know, like, you know, the Bruce Jack mine, you know, Predium, which was, you know, bought out. But I mean, I mean, they were pulling out cores that were just, I don't want to say solid gold, but they were, you know, 20%, 30% gold. And it's like, when you look at the core, it's like, it's, it's like looking, it's like looking at a, at, at, it's like looking at a at big wedding rings, just to, you know, these circles of, of gold coming out of the core. Um, you know, good, good luck with, good luck with those, but, uh, but there is so much else. I mean, we're talking copper, we're talking gold, silver, um, uh, I'll throw some names at you. They're just wonderful companies, wonderful, you know, fireweed metals, a, uh, it's a zinc play, but they also control one of the one of the greatest, one of the best uh, tungsten deposits in North America. If you're interested in, you know, critical industrial metals like zinc or tungsten, you know, you you have to take a look at fireweed. You know, uh, one of the one of the one of the great uh, uh, ought to be developed soon. You know, it takes ten years to do this stuff, but uh, Western copper and gold and uh, uh, beautiful copper porphyry. You are literally mining. The surface of the earth you're standing on the ore body when you jump out of the helicopter the soles of your boots are on ore when you do that uh it, it's it's it, it's hard to describe it other than it's one of the it's one of canada's biggest copper deposits and it's one of canada's biggest gold deposits all in one place you know um you got companies like victoria gold up and running you know moving towards two hundred thousand ounces a year gold production their share price is down a little bit because a the price of gold is down a little bit and B, there were some wildfires near their camp, you know, so they, you know, you know, people sort of shy away from it. Well, the fires are under control and, you know, that they're, they're, they're mining. Uh, great, great companies uh, up in the uh, Golden Triangle, for example, uh, a wonderful, beautiful company, the uh, uh, Dolly Varden. I mean, I visited the Dolly Varden. It, Dolly Varden is an old hundred year old mine, but Dolly Varden Silver is, you know, kind of the roll up of several different mining claims there. Uh, terrific, uh, uh, terrific uh, drilling program. The, the last time they did a resource was 2019. So they're going to do a resource this fall and bring it out January, February, conveniently right before, you know, PDAC in March of 2024. Um, just it, uh, they're, they're going to add all of these ounces of silver that they've been uh, pulling out of the ground for the last couple of years. Uh, and they're going to they're, they're going to they're recalculate their number. I, I suspect it's going to be a beautiful, um, you know, reboot uh, for Camille like Dolly, Dolly Barton. Uh, th I mean, th those are just some of them. I, I saw others that, you know, I mean, wonderful companies, wonderful people. Uh, I, d I don't have don't have a bad word to say about about these people and what they're doing. The, the geology is beautiful. The, the, the technical staff, the geologists, the engineers, I mean, the companies are well run. They've been raising money at good times and bad. They still they still raise their money. Um, and there's just so much going on again. And we are, you know, we're talking, you know, rocks and minerals. We we are so far in the fringe of like the great everybody else investing out there. You know, they, they're all following, oh, NVIDIA, oh, Google, oh, Apple, oh, Tesla. Oh, okay. You know, you guys are going to do what you're going to do. I can't control that. All I can say is like, is, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, half of a percent of the S&P is uh is these is the the mines and minerals guys and so uh uh they they have immense upside again in a world where this BRICS OPEC uh development is unfolding right before our eyes you know um and so you know you, you look at you look at your own country you look at Canada you look at the United States you say oh man our national spending's out of control there's you know the federal uh you know deficits are out of control the debt is exploding the Interest on the debt is exploding. You know how, how do you how do you how do you run a how do you run a national currency when when your government is so, you know, just 
just incompetent in terms of their their fiscal management, right? And their monetary management. How do you do that? Well, I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that uh, um, when on, on the other side of this mess, you know, whenever that is, however many months or years or whatever, on the other side of this mess, something else is going to be valuable, you know. And uh, rather than Canadian dollars or U.S. dollars or something, something else is going to have a lot of value. And I, I, I suspect it's going to look a lot like you know, gold or silver or copper, um, you know, hard assets, you know, energy in the ground, um, energy that you can get out of the ground. Um, wind and solar, that's nice. But but again, wind and solar, for all of the hype, oh, they're growing, they're exploding, they're doing this, they're doing that. Yes. Okay. When you look at the numbers, oh, this is solar, and this is wind, this is how many, this is how much we're adding and all that. But when you look at the, what, that, what is the installed base of energy and how much energy do we use? Like, you know, this is how much energy we use every day, and I'm trying to get my hands in, the, in this screen here. If this is how much energy we use every day, this is how much is solar and wind. Everything else, oil, gas, coal, uranium, um, and then we see, well, well, it's going to change. Yeah, it's going to change, but it's not going to change fast enough to uh, uh, to displace everything else. We had, you know, just gets back to that earlier discussion. Yeah, I, I love to hear you talk about these companies and what they're doing because I think your passion for all of it is just really clear. And it's it's also very clear the potential that they have moving forward into the future. I did want to ask you though, so we have to wait, I guess, until we get to that time of potential. And I wonder about the, the challenges that you see for mining companies while we are waiting to get there. Well, we're over here, we're waiting to get over there where, where we come out on the other side. Yeah. Well, um, you know, mining companies are companies, you know, uh, and, it's, and the big, the, the, the relatively big and the big publicly traded companies, they're subject to the same, you know, whims and caprices and social, you know, uh, gravities that, that everybody else is. And so, you know, mining companies have to present their corporate face to the world. They have to face Wall Street. They have to face Bay Street. And yeah, we're into that ESG stuff. And yeah, we're into that DIE stuff. And yeah, we're, you know, boy, you know, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're toads with you, everybody, you know, it, they have to, they have to do that. And so that does slow things down quite a bit, you know, uh, um, in terms of, their, you know, somebody's ability to, to just, you know, to, to, to make a decision. I mean, and, when when you add these layers of complexity to decision making, you're adding a lot of friction to the to the to the circle, to the gear shift, to the gear system, you know. And uh, it's it's hard enough to decide that you're going to build this, you know, 1.2 billion dollar mine, or that you're going to build this three billion dollar project, or whatever. Um, I mean, if you're a really big company, big big oil companies, big mining companies, one one of, the, one of their similar similarities is that they're really big bank companies. You know, they're really big money companies. You know. They are in the oil business, or they're in the mining business, or whatever. But and, you know, they they mine stuff and they generate a lot of money, or they produce oil and they generate a lot of money. They're in the money business, and it's a, how much of this money do we put back into the ground? How much money do we put into steel and welding and machinery and you know transportation and you know hiring staff and hiring people to do all the things we have to do to build this big offshore platform or build this big you know you know re, you know reboot this refining system or re, you know build this big mine, build this big mill, this whole big processing system yeah um so so when when you're in when you're in they're, they're subject to a lot of outside forces they're sub, the same forces that affect money everywhere affect you know the mining and the oil the energy side too you know and so um uh you know for example i'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to say western copper and gold one of their they're, they're one of their 19 19.9 percent owners is rio tinto Okay, Rio Tinto, they're a big company. They, you know, they're big. They're, you know, uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to badmouth anybody here. I'll just say that, uh, um, you know, it, it's hard to, it's hard to get big companies to make certain decisions. Like, you know, okay, guys, let's, let's move forward with this. And, you know, they're, they're waiting for, you're always waiting for something else. There's got to de risk something else, de risk this, de risk that. And then somebody comes up with some new, oh, well, we have to make sure that we, you know, check these boxes on the checklist, you know, the new checklist of all the, you know. And so so you have that. Now, you don't so much have that. You have it, but you don't have it in the much smaller companies. These little explorers, you know, when I say little, I mean, they might be a 50, 80, $100 million market cap company, you know. Uh, they're, they're not some 
25, 50 billion dollar, you know, big powerhouse. But but I mean, some of these little explorers, um, all they have to do is is pull the right core out of the ground, you know, and and uh, they are set to to explode upwards. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll mention another of my you know, the, the small ones that I visited. Just you know, just between us, just between you and me, and the, whoever is watching out there, um, metallic metallic minerals, metallic M E T A L L I C uh, minerals. They they have properties in the Yukon, and they have another property in Southwest Colorado, um, which is uh, a, a fascinating. Uh, uh, piece of geology, but they 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 drilled a hole last year that was something something like seven hundred meters, something like six hundred eighty meters, something like that. Do the math, you know, you know, not quite half a mile of a hole, and pretty much all of it was mineralized copper, you know, copper mineralization at at very attractive numbers, you know. Uh, well, that they they stopped drilling not because they ran out of mineralization, but because the drill was so deep that they, they kind of couldn't get the drill deeper, you know, just based on the size of the rig. So they, they pulled it all out. They, you know, laid it all out. They checked out, they assayed the things. They put out the numbers at PDAC, you know, last winter, you know. And I was there. I was standing there in uh, in the um, event center there in Toronto. And I was just kind of watching um, companies come by and look at their rocks, you know, look at their core all laid out on the table there. And I, I, I must have stood there for couple hours over a period of several days and a whole lot of companies with very 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 familiar names big companies that walked by and those geologists were, wow well they have a they have a deal now with newcrest you know the australian group um they're they're drilling some more holes right now as we speak uh and um so uh in september i'm going to go out there and you know take a look at some more of their rocks and you know see what they got uh but uh, that that's the kind of thing where you know the first hole is like whoa this is pretty interesting you drill two or three more holes like that and you have you have a company maker there you know and so uh so th th this is just one example out of i could i could list others but again you know i, I write a newsletter so we try to we said try to save things for the subscribers too you know but i'm just trying just i'm giving you all out there watching i'm giving you the courtesy of being honest here you know this is where we're at yeah, I really appreciate that. I, I think that was a great example to kind of illustrate the points that you want to make there. I think that that's all I have for you today. We went through a lot of different points, but before we wrap up, I just want to ask if there's any final thoughts that you would share with investors, I guess, as we're heading toward the end, well, not the end of 2023, but the last quarter of the year. Sure. Well, that's, you know, lots of things to think about. I mean, as, as we speak now, we're coming into the end of August and, you know, in the U.S. and can you know, Labor Day is coming, and everybody's coming back from their vacation, and you know they're going to be going to be back to the office and everything else uh, uh, this fall. Um, there's so much going on in terms of, say, you know, monetary. I mean, we 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 will probably get some more interest rate increases from the Fed. You know, okay, it is what it is. It's probably going to be inflationary out there. I, the inflation is baked into the pie out there. Uh, in so so many ways, all those all those dollars floating around out there um, have to go somewhere, and so they go down to the uh, they go down to the cash register, and you know when when people are buying goods, when they're buying you know fuel for your car or truck or food at the store or goods or whatever, um, you know more you know more interest rates, more inflation. Um, I I anticipate you know pricier oil. When you look at the BRICS OPEC thing, when people say, well, they didn't come up with a BRICS currency unit. They didn't, but they did. It's called oil. You know, they're going when they want to, you know, generate more income for themselves. They, they, maybe they don't need their own currency unit right now. They just turn the valve this way instead of that way. You know, and uh, oh, sorry, we're going to cut our production by another hundred thousand or another million barrels a day, or you know, whatever. You know, and there go, there goes there goes the price of gasoline and jet fuel. You know, um, so that is happening. That and. Meanwhile, again, the you know while everybody's focused on Nvidia or you know these big big blowout numbers, oh artificial intelligence, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd settle for some real intelligence in the people who make decisions in this world, but that, maybe that's just me. Um, uh, again, the, the 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 real assets of the world for Western investors like you, like you know, 
what for what for us Western investors who don't have our own printing press in the Bureau of Printing and Engraving, we don't have our own computer in the basement of the Federal Reserve Building. For those for mere mortals like us, mere civilian mortals like us, what can we do? Real assets, hard assets. Uh, a lot of these things, guys, are on sale. Uh, could that could the share price go down? Yeah, of course it could go down. But you know. Uh, is the downside kind of limited? Yeah, I mean, how far how far down can gold really go? How far how much fruit, how far down can silver really go in a world where you know where, where there, it's it's just in huge demand? Uh, and the upside is unlimited. It, uh, some of the upsides for the explorers are are fabulous. The uh, security of certain investments, um, like I, I mentioned, uh, refiners, uh, some of the great big integrated oil companies with their you know just inviolable dividends. They are out there if that's what you're looking for in terms of safety. So, um, so I think those are my final thoughts. You know, yeah, we 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 go into the end of the year. Obviously, come you know mid October, November, December, you get into that tax loss selling thing at the end of the year. That's always kind of bargain hunting time. Make sure you have some cash in your pocket to pick up a few shares of, of great companies. Uh, and then and 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 again, it's going to be event driven. Uh, you know what's going to happen? Yeah, what's going to happen in Ukraine? I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I hope the war ends. You know, if the war ends, that that could be a lift for a lot of things. Uh, sanctions might start to go away, and you know, the world might loosen up a little bit. You know, tensions in the in Asia, you know, uh, anything can happen. Um, we, it's out of our control. It's out of our control. But what you can control is, you know, look look for some secure income. Look for uh, the security of of hard assets. Uh, you know, again, you know, gold, silver, metals, energy, oil and gas. Do not buy into this argument that oil and gas are going away. Not in not in our lifetime. And and I mean, I'm I'm a little bit older than you. I'm not going to brag about it or anything else. But not in my lifetime, and I doubt it in yours, Charlotte. All right, I think that's a really solid place for us to wrap up. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about all the the various topics that we went through today. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Charlotte. Everybody who's watching, thank you. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com, and this is Byron King. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.